Welcome to the Palm Springs Church. We are not as, uh, I guess, vigorous in numbers this week as we were last week, but that's all right. We're glad that you're here. That uh, noise you heard last Sunday about 1.30 was me hitting the couch. Uh, I nosedived into that thing, and I don't think I woke up till Wednesday sometime, and I was sick from uh, our granddaughter came home. She was sick this week, so uh, we had a pretty eventful week at the house this week. Want to direct everybody's attention, we had, do have new paint and new sheetrock work done out in the foyer. Uh, we want to thank Mr. Octavio, and I can never pronounce his last name, but he and his crew have been here the last three weeks making sure that the, the foyer and the parlor look great. They did a fantastic job with the paint, the paint colors. They look great. So uh, we've got a few more details that need to be finished up out there, some new lights and some new baseboards. And once we do that, we're going to maybe rearrange some things, but uh, it's, it's a, a, an entrance that uh, has definitely changed over the last three weeks anyway, and we're going to get that uh, up and running. We've got some travelers this week. I think Joel's out of town. David Jones is out of town. There may be some others that we're missing. The Johnsons are out of town, so let's, let's be in prayer for them. My wife is headed back to Amarillo. I don't know if she's watching right now, but if she is, uh, Aviana did okay. Uh, no separation anxiety yet, but we're not trying to put her down for a nap either. So uh, we had a lot of things to keep her busy. It is uh, it's funny how things play out over time. It, it seems just like yesterday that we were uh, going through some songs, some Christmas carols, and we were looking at Jesus and the Christmas carols and the scriptures that they were based on. And we were the, the advent, the coming of of the Christ child. And then we had a little bit of a break. And in the last few weeks, we've looked at uh, being against all odds, against all odds. Jesus fulfilled prophecies that some were 700 years old and, and older, and some went all the way back to what we call Genesis chapter one, uh, when God himself said that there would be enmity between the serpent and her son, and her son in that context would be Jesus. And so the, the, we, we've, we've looked at his birth, and we've looked at his death last week, or the week before, and his resurrection last week. And again, today we're going to start with something else. We're going to look again at his birth. We're going to look again at the incarnation. So, if Joseph, I think you got that pulled up. Let me go through that one and that one. But to understand the incarnation, to understand what it is, we need to understand something about the Trinity. We need to understand something about the Trinity. If you've got your handouts, the word there is Trinity. Now, the Old Testament doesn't use the word Trinity. It doesn't actually even teach about the Trinity in, in great detail, but it's there. There is a doctrine of the Trinity in the Old Testament, all the way back in Genesis. If you read with me, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. And thank you, Jim, for reading Psalm 50 this morning. It really ties into what we're saying here, what God is saying here. Dominion over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And so I'm asking the question, to whom is God talking? God is talking to God. He says, let us make. He didn't say, hey, guys, What's what I'm getting ready to do? He said, let us. And so I am assuming in that context, within that, God is saying to God, God the Father is saying God to, to God the Son, to God the Holy Spirit, let us triune the Trinity. Let us make mankind in our image. Hebrews chapter 1 Chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 reads this way. When we get to the New Testament, man, we, we see the Trinity all over the place. It says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he had provided purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. 
God and the Son equal there together. The psalmist would write over in Psalm 104, verse 30, talking about the creation of things and all the animals that were created, says that, says this, thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created. And in that context, he's talking about all the animals, all the creation. He says, you send forth your spirit out into the world and it creates. And the spirit there, he's talking about there's the Holy Spirit. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity have been, have always been, have existed before anything that we call time, together, unified. Now, as we go through the Old Testament, we understand that God doesn't reveal himself as a Trinity God there because it, it, if you look at it, he reveals himself a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time as man is able to handle it. And if you'll recall, God is, is trying to pull out a certain people from amongst everyone. And everyone has multiple gods. Well, we worship the God of the pen. We worship the God of the trees. We worship the God of the breeze. We worship the God of the river. We worship all these different gods. And God says, no, there is only one God. I am him. I am that one God. When Jesus was baptized, another great point in the, in the New Testament, when Jesus was baptized over in Matthew chapter 3, it says that he went straight up out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, lighting up on him, and a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, all coexisting together as one, equal not the same, but equal. The word incarnation is another word that doesn't appear in the Bible. It's a Latin word. We read it when we read John chapter 1, verse 14. When we read it in Latin, the word incarnus is there. Incarnus means in, I in, in, and then carnus is flesh, in flesh. We'll get to that in a minute. I know you see it, you're jumping ahead on your, on your handout. We're not there yet. I won't, I won't define it completely there or here. But he's talking about being in the flesh, flesh being the, the solid part of our body. We all have flesh that covers our bones, in carnus, in flesh. But God would say, Jesus would say, that God is spirit over in John chapter 4, verse 24 when he's talking to the woman at the well. And so you ask the question, what, what does Jesus mean when he says God is spirit? He's saying God's essential nature is spirit. The same way the coffee table out there in the parlor, the essential nature of that coffee table is wood. The essential nature, the things that make up God, the thing that makes God God is that he is spirit. So in understanding this, we're, uh, we're, we're trying to understand and wrap our mind around that when Jesus would talk to Nicodemus about the Spirit, he says, it's like the wind. You can see its result. You don't know where it's coming. You don't know where it's going, but you see the result of it. That's God. We can't see him with our physical abilities, but we sense him. We know him through our spiritual abilities, those that he puts inside of us, the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And so it is God's plan. God's plan of salvation, the Holy Trinity. When I say God, I'm talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It is their plan to bring about salvation for mankind. One of them is going to have to be placed inside a human body. Placing the eternal, immortal, invisible Son of God in a body of flesh. And so we're left with the question, well, what does that mean? What does the incarnation mean? And we'll get there in just a minute, but I want to, I want to take a look at what it doesn't mean, a couple of things that it doesn't mean. The first thing that it doesn't mean is that God is less than God. 
The incarnation of God does not mean that he is now less than God. He is completely God. God's nature cannot change according to Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. He is the same yesterday, the same today, the same tomorrow. His nature never changes. He is and always has been and always will be God. But the gospel accounts show that the Lord Jesus still possessed all the attributes of God, even while he was on earth. In fact, in one chapter, Luke chapter 7, we're going to see the great omni chapter, the omni attributes that belong to God alone, being omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, we see that, that Jesus, again, the incarnate word, God made flesh, is omnipresent. He's everywhere. Romans, uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 1 through 10, there's a Roman centurion whose daughter is sick. And he comes to Jesus and he says, can you heal my daughter? And Jesus says, well, let's go to your house. And the centurion says, no, there's no need. I'm a man of authority. I'm a man of power. I recognize authority and power in you. You say the word and it happens. I command armies. When I tell them to jump, they say how high. You say the word and my daughter will be healed. And Jesus was stunned and he looked out at the people and says, in all of Israel, I've not seen such faith. And so Jesus heals the daughter who is several miles away. How can he do that? He's standing here physically. How can he do something and affect someone miles away? It's because he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's everywhere at all times. And then we see a little bit later that he's omnipotent in verses 11 through 17. When we look at the widow of Nain's son and the funeral, as they're passing by, Jesus holds up the funeral and he says to the boy, young man, I say to you, arise. Now, this is not the first person that's been brought back from the dead, but this is the first time that it's not been done with a prayer and with asking, you know, invoking God's power. And why is that? It's because he is God. He is fully God. He is completely God. And so he only has to call upon his own power. He says, I say to you, arise. I have that power. I have that authority because I am God. As Luke chapter 7 finishes out, we see that he's omniscient, that he knows everything. Luke chapter, uh, verses 36 through 50, they're reclined at the table and, and there's a woman at the feet of Christ in repentance. And Simon, the man with whom Jesus was dining, was disgusted that Jesus would allow this woman anywhere near him. And Simon thought to himself that obviously, and, and the Bible says he thought to himself that obviously Jesus didn't know what kind of woman this was. And the Lord showed Simon that not only did he know what about this woman's life, he knew what thoughts were in Simon's heart. He said, this woman has not stopped kissing my feet since I got here. What did you do? You didn't even offer to wash my feet. Simon, you hard-hearted man. Because he knew the hearts of people. He knew the minds of people. He was all of the omnis. He was omnipresent. He was omnipotent. He was omniscient. He was nothing less than God. God did not become incarnate just to be less than God. But he didn't become man to be less than man either. The incarnation does not mean that God became less than man. Although he was not merely a man, he really was a man. He was not a phantom, nor was he like one of those TV characters. Hi, I'm David and I play a doctor on TV. That wasn't Jesus. He, wasn't, he didn't say, I play, I play Jesus on earth. I play a human being on earth. He fully was man. He experienced weariness. He experienced hunger. He experienced heat and cold. He experienced thirst. He experienced physical pain. He even experienced death itself. Last week we looked at that, that death was his, that the death that he took was not deserved. God raised him because of his faithfulness. 
God didn't become less than God, neither did he become less than man. So what did happen at the incarnation? God, in the person of the Son, took on human nature, nature in addition to his divine nature. It wasn't a subtraction. I'm less than God, I'm less than man, and we'll put those two together. No, I am fully God, and I am fully man, and we will combine those things. We will be united, and we'll be called the Messiah. He was both God and man. Ronald Nash says this, when we understand it, the incarnation expresses beliefs. As Christians, it expresses our belief that Jesus Christ is fully God, he possesses all the essential properties of God, and that Jesus Christ is also fully, fully human. That is, he possesses all the essential properties of being human. Now, don't get hung up on that because we, we might consider an essential property of being human sin. It's not an essential property. It is not something that we just have to have. It's not something we're born with. It's something that we commit. It's something that we do. It's things that we do that God says don't do. It's not doing things that God says these are okay to do. Jesus was not born with sin. He had the ability to sin. He sure did, but he overcame that ability. Every second of every minute of every day of every breath that he ever drew, he had the ability, he took the ability to overcome that sin. Fully God, fully human. I don't understand that. Welcome to Palm Springs. Welcome to church. Welcome to being a believer in Jesus Christ. Welcome to being a believer in God. Welcome to being a believer in the Holy Spirit. I don't understand it either. I don't. I do not. I cannot fathom how God, infinite God, can place himself in finite man. It's beyond my ability to fully comprehend. But it's not beyond God's capability to fully implement. Before we get to a little bit more of the incarnation, I want to go through a few things that I think it means. We're going to go back to that word, incarnate. In the flesh. It's a, an archaic word. It's a word that we don't use anymore. Most, most people know that Latin is, is pretty much a dead language now. But it talks about incarnate flesh healing over a wound. When you look at it, it's a medical term. How many of you have scars in your hands or on your arms or maybe some on your face? I've got a few on my head from scrapes in the past, a few in other places. Maybe Mr. Mike has scars from surgery on your knee just a, a few short weeks ago. Others have scars in various places. What happens to that scar? Does it just stay open? Does that wound just stay open and it's just a big mess forever? The flesh heals over that, doesn't it? That's what, that's what our flesh is designed to do. It's designed to heal over that wound. What have we talked about sin doing? It mortally wounds us, doesn't it? Sin kills us. It kills our spirit. It kills us, that relationship with us, between us and God. But it also kills us physically. Because of sin in the world, we will all taste a physical death. Unless Jesus comes back between now and then, it's all something we've got to look forward to. We're all going to physically die. But Jesus came to heal over that mortal wound. He came incarnate, in the flesh. It says God comes among us in the form and in the weakness of humanity to bring healing to our weak and wounded bodies. Praise God, hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I could do some healing in my lower back. That's not, that's not what he does, though. He doesn't just, well, here's, 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 David's, broken, here's David's broken arm. Let's heal over that. Here's, 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 
here's this and that. Let's just heal over that miraculously. He heals over that wound that kills us. He makes us whole again. He makes us strong again. The wound that kills us death, he heals over that wound. So when he came in flesh, that's what he did. Because of the incarnation, it means a lot of different things, way too many for us to try to go into this morning. I mean, there are hundreds, perhaps thousands, and there's, what, seven, eight billion of us on the planet right now, let alone all those who've come before us. So there's at least eight billion reasons that, you know, this means anything to us. For our Core 52 book, it stresses that it means God came near. When you look at that part of it, it also means that, as we've studied the last few weeks, that God fulfilled his promises. God fulfilled his prophecies. When God stated things would happen, he fulfilled them in the coming of Jesus Christ. When God came to earth in the form of Jesus, when he came to earth in the form of the Messiah, he fulfilled his prophecies. He fulfilled his promises. And because of that, we have a clearer image of God. We see God more clearly because the Son came to reveal who God was. When we look at Greek mythology, when we look at the Roman gods, we see just a haphazard group of bloodthirsty, sexual thirsty type people who are vengeful, who are unfaithful, who are untruthful, who are murderous. They quarrel among themselves. They try to defeat each other's plans. They, they, they can only be appeased by human sacrifice offerings. But when Jesus came and revealed the true nature of God, he revealed God as the God, the Father, as loving, as caring, as doing everything possible to reconcile his rebellious creation, to reconcile us to himself. As we sang earlier, he is a good, good father. So we have a clearer image of who God is. Is God a wrathful God? Yes, he pours his wrath out on sin. And he will pour his wrath out on sinners who are found outside of Jesus Christ on that great and glorious day. Is he a vengeful God? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But that's because he's seeking justice. And he will pour out his wrath on those who he will. But because of the incarnation, because of what Jesus did, we have a clearer image of God. We also have a deeper knowledge of God. Stop and think for a moment. How many of your favorite stories are found in, in the last third of the Bible, the New Testament, what we call the New Testament, the Gospels, the Epistles, the other writings? How many of your favorite stories are there? I mean, we've got the Beatitudes there in Matthew chapter 5. We've got the story of the, the parables. We've got the stories of the Good Samaritan. We've got the story of the prodigal son. We've got the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. It's all about love. And we've just got so many marvelous, wonderful things there. Paul diagrams out the marvelous description of the plan of salvation. And when we get to the book of Revelation, we see a revealed a glimpse of what heaven is going to be like, what it looks like what we can expect when we get there. Without the incarnation of God, we don't have those things. And so we get a deeper knowledge of God. We also get a more defined purpose because of God. Do you know without God coming in the form of Jesus Christ, we would not be here today in this church building. This church building would not exist. Church buildings around the world would not exist. Some other things wouldn't exist either. Orphanages, women's shelters, Alcoholics Anonymous places for refuge for, for the alcoholic who's trying to gain some control over that particular issue. Hospitals. Those things wouldn't exist if God hadn't come. And how do I know that? Because when I look back in the Old Testament, I don't see any hospitals there. They might have a doctor in town. They might have, they might have, you know, they have synagogues where they come to read the scripture and other things like that. 
but they're not going out of their way to, to have orphanages. They're not going out of their way to provide for the sick and for the poor. You know, in World War II, uh, actually uh, before that in China, 1920, when there was a famine, when there was a bad crop year, do you know what they did to the families? They would drive, drive grandma and grandpa out into the wilderness. I look around the room, I see a lot of gray hair and I see some with no hair. That grandma and grandpa status applies to a whole lot of us. There weren't enough tomatoes on the vine this year, not enough cucumbers in the ground. We didn't have enough potatoes or enough rice. Guess where you're going, Grandpa, Grandma? You're going out. You're not coming back. Christian missionaries in China were overrun with elderly people that they were trying to feed in the 1920s. It doesn't exist without the church. In World War II, there was a pilot who was on a bomb run in the South Pacific, and as he was making his way back to the aircraft carrier plane was running low on fuel and he passed over a, a, a chain of islands and he looked over his co-pilot and he says, we're going to have to land this thing because we don't have enough fuel to get back. And so they make one pass over, over the islands and they're afraid because there's, there's stories of cannibalism. People eating flesh, it does come from that word in Cronus. People who are flesh eaters. And as they make their last pass, they see on an island a, a, a nice little building with a steeple and a cross on top. And the co-pilot looks at him and says, we're going to be okay. They've got a church right there. Let's land here. They're not going to eat us here. That pilot, thinking back on it after the war was over, became a believer in Christ. He was one who would stand up and say, there is no God, there is no anything before, but after that day, we were given a purpose to go into all the world to tell people who God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit are, to tell them that God came to earth to redeem us, to buy us back, to be near us, to give us purpose, to give us knowledge, to give us insight, to make us different, to set us apart from the rest of the world that is filled with darkness and is dying. Because God came, we have hope. We have hope. In our class this past Wednesday night, and let me encourage everybody to uh, become a part of that class. We're going to start back on our 452 topic this week. In our class, we talked about what the resurrection means to us. A lot of us said that it's because of the resurrection that we have a hope. We have a hope of eternal life. We have hope to see our faithful forefathers, to see those who have come before us, to see them in heaven. We have a hope to see Jesus face to face. We have a hope to see our Redeemer face to face. We have a hope that once this plane of existence is over, we don't disappear, that we don't spend eternity in torment, in torture, in hell. That we get to walk a street made of gold. We have a hope that not only do we have that hope that sits beyond our physical life here, we have the hope that exists in one another. The hope to be able to overcome our daily issues. The hope to be able to come overcome our daily sin, our daily struggle. The hope that that if you need something, you can come to me and I will do everything I can to help you get that. The hope that I have that if I need something, I can come to you. The hope that we have to be able to share one another's burdens. Absolute hope that does not exist to the extent and to the level that it does among those who are believers. Believers that God came to earth and took on human form. There is no resurrection without an incarnation. Let's never forget that. As much as we celebrate the resurrection, and we absolutely should celebrate the resurrection, there is no resurrection without an incarnation. If God had not chosen to come to earth, none of this would matter. Nothing that we do matters. 
if he had not been raised from the dead, absolutely none of this matters. God came to bring us healing. He came to cover our wounds. He came to give us a clear image of who he is. He came to give us a deeper knowledge of who he is. He came to impart to us wisdom and give us a purpose. And he came to give us absolute hope and we could go on and on. We could be the Energizer Bunny and we still wouldn't have enough energy to get through all the things that God has done by coming to earth. And what's more and what is still incredible is that, is that as God came near to us, he invites us to come near to him. Roman gods, Greek gods, all these other gods that are out there, they don't ask that. They don't make provision for that. They don't want that. God, Jehovah God, Yahweh wants that. Designed it that way. That's why he came to earth to show us, I want you near me. I hope we get to discuss that a little bit more in our class on Wednesday. The invitation is yours. God came near to you. Will you choose to come near to him? You have an opportunity to give your life to him, to yield your will to his, to accept his gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, the son of God, and have the Holy Spirit live inside of you. Have a part of God living inside of you. Let's stand and sing. Mike's got a good song picked out for us. We offer that invitation at this time. So... Heal and forgive. He lived and died. He by my pardon. An empty grave is that he proved my Savior lived. Because he lived, I can say tomorrow. Again, thank you for being here. We hope that uh, you enjoyed yourself and got something from God's word this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to stand before you and uh, share some little bit of what I can with you. Hope that your day and the rest of your week is filled with love and joy and that you remember that Jesus is God, that he came near and you can come near to him any moment.
Let's, let's pray. God, our Father in heaven, we, we stand amazed how awesome you are. To be fully God and fully man is unfathomable. But as our faith grows, as it deepens, as it broadens, we pray that you give us the wisdom and the insight and the understanding as to how much more that means how it applies to us and how we can share that with a lost and dying world, a world that wants and seeks and craves intimacy. Help us, Father, to be intimate with you and to share that intimacy with the rest of the world. Give us strength, give us grace, give us mercy. We praise you through your Son, by the power of the Spirit. Amen. May God's peace go with you. Shalom.